Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to master classes in critical care medicine from the Shoda Hospitals in association with the ISACM Hyderabad chapter. Today's topic is uh, acute liver failure. Case discussion by Dr. Vignesh and Dr. Uday Kira. Both are DNB final year students from Nishoda Hospital, Sikindrabad. To, to, to take the case, we have senior uh, consultant Dr. Srinivas Samvedam sir uh, and uh, another consultant Dr. Tapas Kumar Sahu, Associate Director and uh, Head of the Department of Critical Care Medicine, Medanta Ranchi. Dr. Vignesh, you can start the case. Uh, see, before Srinivas. that, uh, both of them, uh, Dr. Srinivas sir and uh, Dr. Tapas, Srinivas sir was a part of both local and national um, uh, EC for a long time and Srinivas are being both the general secretary and a vice president and now also being a part of many committees so and an academic seasoned teacher for DNB and uh, DM critical care and also been a seasoned uh, speaker across the globe including um, um, the different parts of India and been uh, part of many academic sessions only in India associated with Australia also and Tapas in the same way has been uh, a, what do you say, being a, um, a torch bearer for the EDIC program's uh, initiative to actually connect a different part of Europe. So with this, I will hand over to both uh, Vignesh and uh, Uday. Sir, uh, it is a privilege and honor for us to have both of you on board, sir. Srinivas, sir, and Tapas. Thank you, Venkat, uh, for those kind words. Uh, yeah. I remember when this uh, master class series started, I opened the batting. Uh, yes. and, I, and I think uh, it has been a good innings. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> long <it's>, innings, in fact. <laughs> long innings. So I think the second innings has started again. Yes. You asked me to open the innings. Uh, yes. So I am happy to open again. Thank you. Uh, and thank uh, you. Thank you, Dr. Venkat, for this great initiative. Happy to be part of it for the second time in uh, one month time. Thank you. Please go ahead. Dr. Vignesh, please go ahead. Sorry, sir, there's a disturbance with the connection. We are trying to reconnect it, actually. So it's a 38 years old male presented with a headache, fever, and a, a fever on and off with, without chills, fatigue, and weakness for the past five days. Next slide, please. So he's actually presented to the outside. Next slide, please. So actually presented to the outside hospital initially when he developed uh, these symptoms and the initial uh, workup has been done in the outside hospital where they found out to have uh, deranged LFTs and tropical workup has been deemed to be negative. And uh, there he was receiving uh, supportive care such as IV fluids and uh, septroaxone there. Then in the course of time, the patient developed uh, altered mental status and the patient was referred to Yashoda Hospital for uh, evaluation and uh, further management here. Going into the further history, the patient doesn't have any similar complaints in the past and there was no known comorbidities, no significant uh, drug intake or any alternative medicine history is there. And uh, he was uh, an occasional uh, uh, alcoholic and uh, this, his, his friend actually had a similar complaints for a week actually and both have been giving a history of both have attended a marriage a week ago. And uh, they have showed a empty, half empty strip of paracetamol actually, which he has been taking for a headache and fever for the past five days. And no significant family history has also been noted. On arrival into the ER, the patient was uh, drowsy, arousable, not uh, following commands, not oriented to time, place and person. And he was febrile. And initial blood pressure uh, uh, was uh, 110 by 60 and heart rate was 130 um, 130 per minute, you know, saturating 94 at uh, four, 4 liters of oxygen, the respiratory rate of 88, 28. And uh, per abdominal examination, we didn't find any uh, distension, tenderness, or organomegaly. And uh, uh, serious examination, no abnormality is actually seen. The patient is uh, mildly trick otherwise, but uh, no evidence of any pad or uh, clubbing or uh, edema or uh, lymphadenopathy has been noted in the patient. Next slide, please. And the patient in view of uh, low GCS and altered mental status, the patient was intubated in the ER itself and the patient uh, then shifted to ICU for further management. This is the initial ABG which has been taken in the ER. 
with an uh, pH of 7.32 with uh, bicarb of 15 and lactates of uh, 3. That the patient received uh, 1 liters of uh, fluid and uh, the patient got shifted to ICU for further management. In view of altered mental status, before shifting to the ICU, the patient underwent uh, an uh, CT brain uh, where uh, it showed uh, features of uh, cerebral edema actually. And an ultrasound evaluation also has been done in the ER itself because the outside reports had shown uh, deranged LFTs. So, which showed a liver in normal lecotexture, no evidence of uh, intrahepatic biliary radicals dilation, and spleen was uh, normal, and uh, kidneys uh, were, main were normal with uh, CMD is maintained. The patient was initially treated with uh, serpentine sulfactam. Uh, and an IV start, started on IV fluids at uh, 1 ml per kg per hour and the mechanical support was uh, continued and uh, NAC, in, NAC was infusion was initiated as uh, until this point of time we don't know the cause what is causing uh, the deranged liver functions at, at this point of time. So the initial laboratory values in the outside hospital uh, showed uh, uh, normal hemoglobin with an increased total uh, bilirubin with an in, with an uh, indirect bilirubin of uh, seven seven, and an uh, ALT STD of uh, two thousand one seventy and by uh, uh, nine hundred, with uh, increased INR of uh, seven point one. So in our hospital, the initial investigation showed a nearly similar kind of picture with an increase in bilirubin uh, impact uh, with uh, ASTLT of uh, 600 uh, plus and uh, INR of uh, 3.9. And after uh, initial resuscitation in the ER, this is the ABG which we have in the ICU, which shows a 7.28 pH with uh, uh, 19 uh, carbon uh, bicarbonate and 42 of uh, carbon dioxide and 2.4 was uh, lactates. We have initially sent uh, investigations uh, and uh, which showed uh, uh, since the patient had an hepatic uh, in liver involvement with encephalopathy, we have sent for uh, 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 workups of uh, uh, viral tropical viruses which uh, showed uh, HBS, AG, HCV and HCV came out to be negative and uh, HIV came out to be uh, positive. So, provisional diagnosis of uh, an hepatic encephalopathy is made with the background of cerebral edema as well. And the patient was uh, started on 3% uh, NACL and uh, lactulose for uh, treatment of uh, hepatic encephalopathy. And uh, initial, uh, we guided, uh, we started on IV fluids, maintenance fluid of 1 ml per kg with uh, uh, SOS bolus fluids of. Uh, uh, balance crystalloid solu balance salt solution uh, guided by uh, PPV to start with. So on day one. Yes. So and, uh, in uh, day two, uh, we have an uh, decreasing trend of the liver enzymes was seen and uh, a slightly decrease in uh, a total bilirubin is uh, also seen and uh, ABG coming back to normal. But the sensorium uh, remained uh, still uh, same actually. So we did an EEG on uh, day two of uh, uh, the illness, uh, which showed uh, which doesn't show any episodes of uh, epilepsy. Or... Yeah, one second. I think uh, Tapas and uh, Srinivas sir, uh, this is like any regular case which we take from the first slide from the initial presentation to the end. They can go back to the first slide, and uh, now you got a hands-on of the case. We can oh. go to the first slide, and sir, wherever you want, you can stop, sir. Yeah, uh, yeah, Dr. Vignesh, could you yes. please go to the history? Like, uh, could you summarize your case from the history itself rather than going into the labs as well as the day one and day two? On the initial presentation, how you would right now uh, uh, place the patient? Like, okay. where is it right now? Yeah, from the history itself. The patient presented with uh, constitutional uh, symptoms with uh, altered mental status, sir. Mm -hmm. So it can be. Uh, yes, go back to the first line, now. Uh, one more slide back, please. Uh, first slide, please. Just a second, sir. Just... Uh, carry on, carry on. Doctor Day. Yes, sir.
sir visible sir yeah visible make yeah. it uh, full size yes yeah, full size only sir yeah yeah there's a little bit of lag between your uh, changing yeah, but, it that's fine go on so full screen is okay sir yeah okay done yeah, yeah please go on please yeah, continue continue mm -hmm. Yeah, so the initial complaints were a headache, fever on and off with fatigue and weakness, which has happened for the five days. This is the initial clinical picture the patient presented with. And the initial workup uh, showed a derangement in the left mm -hmm. This is the patient which we had. And uh, within uh, three days of hospital admission in the outside hospital, the patient had an altered mental status. So that is the reason so, the patient had been... Would you please summarize yes. your case from the history? Yeah, so in order of preference, in order of priority, uh, based on this limited amount of information which you gathered, what would you put your differentials as? What is the most likely differential? Second most likely, third most uh, direct, yeah. likely. And how would you narrow it down to the top three uh, so that you can rationalize the investigations further, which we saw already? Okay. Just oh. explain that process. So my top differential is going to be uh, acute liver failure again uh, the, with hepatic encephalopathy. Uh, the, the so so thing, for every every uh, differential you mention, please also say what are the strongest points in favor, what is not in favor. Okay, so that the others who are listening also can sync with your thought process. Uh, sir, uh, initially uh, patient uh, LFT derangement was there uh, that is showing a clinical jaundice and. Uh, Within a span no, of can you go back to the first slide? Start yes. from here. Start from here and trace it forward. That's what Tapas is asking. Yes. Initially, uh, with the constitutional symptoms of a headache, a fever on and off, uh, and uh, fatigue and weakness, it is mostly looking like a, a multi-system involvement, pro probably a viral infections. Uh, in uh, in our endemic endemic areas, uh, most common uh, viral infections. Uh, are uh, dengue, dengue viral infections and uh, 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 hepatitis and uh, other uh, viral infections uh, with constitutional symptoms. No. Uh, so with the history, what you are telling, you can like uh, summarize it like uh, a young guy without any previous comorbidity now presented with acute onset, uh, headache, fever and constitutional symptoms. And uh, based on the other like uh, negative histories, you have excluded all the your malaria as well as dengue workup. Now it is pointing towards something which would be first acute liver failure based on your jaundice as well as your fever, or it could be tropical fever. That can also be one of the differential diagnoses. And the third differential diagnosis, what you are actually right now trying to convey, it can be even uh, sepsis with uh, multi organ dysfunction. Could you go to the next slide? Complicate this issue. Um, I understand that we are discussing a liver failure as a topic, but you are presenting somebody. Can you go back to the first slide, please? At this point of time, we are looking at somebody who is uh, having headache, fever, and fatigue yes. with weakness, which we have not yet described, right? We should also have a neural primary neurological problem as your differential. When you're talking about it, yes, when there was you when you get further information, like there was hepatic derangement, yes, you will bring hepatic involvement as the first possibility. But at this point of time, a primary CNS disease, either an infective process or a vascular process uh, or a demyelinating process, should also be part of your differential at this stage, right? When you go forward, you bring it down to XYZ, right? Yes. And going by what you said, even if you had a hepatic derangement subsequently, it does not rule out a CNS event. Do you understand what I, I'm saying? Yes, sir. Yes, so sir. somebody who's got a liver dysfunction, has got a liver injury, has got a derangement of liver function, is highly likely either to have an intracerebral or a subarachnoid bleed. Right? So it should always be part of your dementia. So if you look at, you know, you, this patient comes to you without that history from another hospital, Right? When you start working him up from the emergency room and you find an imaging that shows a bleed, you can still work up for a cause of the bleed, you know, whether it's coagulopathy or 
uh, whether it is vitamin K antagonist related or hepatic derangement or traumatic. We go in that direction, right? So keep that eye, you know, that perspective open. Don't close it at this stage. All right. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, please explain now how you are going to fit this into what we saw in the first slide. Uh, depending upon the uh, outside lab values, sir, and uh, background encephalopathy, and uh, uh, possibility of uh, in, uh, endemic uh, infections, uh, hepatotrophic infections were uh, most likely in, in our uh, developing countries. Uh, most probably acute uh, hepatitis A virus and hepatitis E virus, most like uh, mildly probable diagnosis, and uh, and other uh, other ethiologies also uh, uh, regarding um, other viruses also can cause uh, hepatitis uh, hepatitis B uh, with uh, R hepatitis D super infection in chronic hepatitis B patients also can be possible, sir. Could it be due to meningoencephalitis? Um, yes, sir. Possibility, uh, yes, uh, with meningoencephalitis, with uh, sepsis, with uh, uh, mods, uh, can explain these features with a background history of a headache and uh, encephalopathy now and uh, derange LFT. Okay. So, how could you again narrow it, narrow it down? Um, depending on depending upon the uh, um, uh, lft derangements uh, based on the values uh, we can uh, narrow it down to uh, hepatotropic virus infections and uh, uh, tropical infections and uh, other uh, systemic sepsis induced uh, lft derangement in case of uh, hepatitis related viral infections uh, uh, in case of hepatitis related viral infections uh, transaminates will be in thousands and uh, uh, bilirubin also be elevated and uh, in case of uh, tropical related uh, tropical uh, infections uh, uh, bilirubin raised and uh, and the tropic uh, transaminates will be not much uh, like uh, hepatotropic viral infections sir it will be around 400, 400. Uh, plus in uh, tropical uh, workup infection with an increased uh, bilirubin and a multi organ dysfunction generally presents with the tropical infections as well but it also depends uh, temporal sequence wise at what temporal point of time you are looking at the LFT, right? Uh, just the quantum of rise of transaminases does not guarantee you uh, that the liver is either getting worse or is getting better, right? So uh, you could also have somebody with uh, hyperacute liver failure whose uh, liver enzymes are actually trending down, but the INR is rising. Now that's a bad sign in the context of assessment of liver function. So never comment on uh, the transaminases alone, whether the liver is getting worse or the liver is getting better. It's always in tandem with two things. One, the albumin, uh, and two, the prothrombin and iron. All right? Yes, yes. Thanks. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, in past history, uh, there is a history of occasional use of alcohol and uh, we, and uh, positive history of uh, similar complaints with a friend who at, attended a marriage one week ago uh, might lead to the uh, differentials of uh, uh, food poisoning and uh, related hepatitis let, uh, hepatitis a and e which has a fake overall route transmission possibility and we ruled out other drug history as well uh, in this uh, case and no significant family history. And this is the first time the patient presenting to the hospital uh, with uh, such kind of uh, an illness. Sir, in the initial happening right now after the uh, negative histories, uh, what is right now your differential diagnosis again at this point of time? Before the day one, go to the last slide. Because you have taken so many specific uh, like uh, history in this uh, slide. 
so what is right now going on in your mind so again the differentials are going to be uh, acute liver failure and tropical infections as well sir because some tropical infections can be negative in the first week of illness so again that is still in our uh, differential diagnosis even at this point of time so half empty strip of paracetamol sol yes sir yes so what is the significance of taking this like uh, history Mm. the patient was having a weakness and headache so the relative told that the patient was on paracetamol so we just wanted to include that whether he has taken excess paracetamol for the headache and fever and that causing this kind of illness actually we just want so to what, that as well so what should we, be the paracetamol dose that could be resulting in acute liver failure uh approximately in 9 grams and about this marriage history how it is significant in current scenario they have attended a marriage ceremony one week ago yes yes so what could be the contributing factor like in this clinical diagnosis from this marriage reception attend outside food didn't take the and the possibility of food poisoning and some uh, infection some which infection. is transfer, uh, transfer to fecal oral route or uh, the locality in which both have traveled both can which type of infection is pertinent in current scenario that could result in this acute liver failure we are not getting that okay hepatitis a can happen yes sir hepatitis hepatitis a and d yes 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 and uh, you have written uh, occasional alcohol intake is there anything uh, like if the patient is a binge alcohol intaker that could result in this type of acute liver presentation failure presentation yes sir there is a possibility of that sir tell me three conditions where uh, though the patient is having chronic liver disease that can present as fulminant uh, like hepatic failure uh, wilson's disease mm -hmm. hepatitis b uh, reactivation of hepatitis b mm -hmm. and uh, bacteria also and autoimmune hepatitis actually can present okay tell me the difference between acute liver failure and acute liver injury uh, acute liver failure means sir uh, the triad of uh, uh, jaundice and encephalopathy and uh, worsening within the span of uh, uh, one week uh it means uh, hyper acute and uh, if it is uh, from 7 to 28 days it is a uh, high acute uh, liver failure the fictitious name that uh, oh grandi oh grand okay mm -hmm. and if it is more than 28 days sub acute uh, it uh, it can identify the cause uh, specific cause of acute liver failures why it is important to classify according to this uh, time of presentation from the encephalopathy uh, in actually the high to know the sense of uh, to know the prognosis and to take in the cause as well can be determined uh, by the type of presentations as in hyperacute most commonly is due to paracetamol or due to an uh, hepatitis c or e and and uh, uh, subacute uh, i mean uh, i mean acute can be because of uh, an hepatitis b virus and in subacute all the other causes will be non paracetamol intoxications and uh, other autoimmune hepatitis everything can fit into that picture of subacute and we look at the prognosis uh, hyperacute has a better prognosis as compared to subacute picture so both we can classify uh, so the classification is actually warranted what is the uh, like uh, the worst picture of uh, hyperacute liver failure that can happen mm. the complication is more in hyperacute the hepatic encephalopathy will be more mm -hmm. pronounced than the jaundice in hyperacute as compared to uh, subacute so subacute has jaundice in cerebral edema part is more in uh, hyperacute presentation and definitely the prognosis is better and what is having the worst prognosis among this hyperacute subacute sir. subacute subacute is there any specific reason why uh, reversibility of a uh, uh, regeneration of liver function will be low in case of uh, subacute variants and uh, prognosis uh, based on this uh, prognosis will be poor in case of subacute uh, variants yeah so the baseline liver status is already low so the regeneration capacity the auto recovery person uh, the probability is less in this type of presentation when already like the liver is compromised a new hit is right now making it worse
Okay. Sir, any questions at this point of time? No, no. Uh, let them go ahead. Uh, we'll, yeah. Yeah. We'll... Okay. In day one, patient has uh, is intubated in ER because of uh, patient has a uh, poor GCS and uh, patient is not oriented to time and pace and very drowsy and irascible and uh, initial BP of uh, 100 by 60 and initial temperature of 101 degree Fahrenheit uh, with uh, saturation saturating around 94 percent with four liters of oxygen support and the respiratory rate uh, in the, around 28 per minute sir. And uh, upon clinical examination, uh, there is no the abdominal distension or tenderness or any uh, organomegaly. And uh, CVS, uh, both S1, S2 had hurt and no added sounds. And the respiratory system, uh, bilateral ves vesicular sounds were hurt. Sir. And uh, uh, in initial ABG, uh, showing a seven point, uh, pH of uh, 7.32 and uh, PCO2 of 31 and a bicarbonate of 15. The metabolic uh, uh, metabolic acidosis with uh, respiratory compensation and uh, with the lactates of three initially and uh, we give uh, in ER uh, fluid research given with a one liter fluid bolus and uh, uh, the labs were sent for uh, a re uh, routine labs. So based on this, what are your priorities in the management of the patient? Can you go back one slide, please? Yeah, so look at these points, which you have, there are multiple issues for us to be concerned about in this patient at this point of time. Uh, so what are your priorities here? So one thing is the patient is uh, drowsy and foreign. So I will take preference uh, over the rest actually, sir. Thinking and making consideration that the BP is still uh, borderline. Okay. So we'll start with fluid resuscitation simultaneously. At the same time, we'll plan and secure the airway as well. Yeah. Second thing we'll point out towards a uh, temperature of 101. So since we have a pro provisional diagnosis of uh, an acute liver failure and hypothermia mm -hmm. has known to cause uh, bad prognosis, that has to be controlled acutely uh, as well to yeah. start with. Yeah. So uh, I just want, I'm curious to know, when somebody is saturating 94% with 4 liters of oxygen, can you actually confidently say that the respiratory system has no abnormality? No, sir. Uh, no, sir. Again. I can see the last line actually. Uh, Tapas, what do you say? Yeah, yes. <laughs> I yes. don't know. Then I'm over reading, but uh, we, uh, you know, somebody with uh, altered sensorium is saturating 94% and lead with four liters of oxygen and is breathing at 28 per minute. I would not put, uh, you know. Uh, my hand up and say the respiratory system is normal until yes. until I prove it that it is normal. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So your uh, two systems are right now are jeopardized. One is CNS as well as respiratory system. And uh, once you do the intubation or airway protect, then the rest of the CVS is also going to be compromised immediately. Yes. BP yes. will go up further, and you have to take care of the hemodynamics at this point of time. Yeah. Yes. So what are the point of care right? like investigations you can do at this point of time along with your uh, ABC? Uh, point of care, uh, two day ago uh, we can do that actually will give us about the uh, systolic function of the heart and uh, other thing what we can do is since we have a provisional diagnosis of an acute liver failure, we can also do an ONSD at this point to check whether the patient actually has a so in the echo in the echocardiogram, what are the things you would like to look for to troubleshoot a patient with liver failure on a background of alcohol use who is hypoxic? Can be a cardiomyopathy can be seen there. So I'll uh, look for any uh, uh, dilatation of uh, left ventricle and uh, as well, and look for uh, any so suppose, uh, degree of systolic function. Now suppose somebody has um, an abnormal tapsy. What would you look for? What would you think of? Precuspid annular plane Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, RV dysfunction is maybe secondary to C. Okay, we'll come to that point later on when we talk about prognosticating these patients. So, pulmonary, we, you know, reno, hepatopulmonary syndrome versus portopulmonary hypertension, we need to take a call, and especially in somebody 
who is subacute. No, you know, hyperacute, you don't need to make much of a difference because hyperacute diagnosis is very easy. But the subacute ones sometimes get superimposed on a background of cirrhosis of liver and portal hypertension. That's when it comes in. We'll we'll talk about it later during the course of the discussion. Okay, please go on. In these are the initial uh, labs at hospital and the outside hospital as well as our hospital where. Uh, the ALD level is in uh, 2000, which again points out to uh, some sort of uh, uh, hepatic viral infection, that is hepatitis uh, infection. And uh, the rest, uh, initially they were INR was 7.1, and, uh, and in our hospital it has come down to 3.9 with the normal creatinine and uh, normal uh, uh, electrolytes as well at the presentation. And the bilirubin as well is uh, raised in 10. So, initial investigations as well shown at that uh, uh, hepatitis virus like HBCG, HCV, and HCV all were negative, and the HAV become uh, positive on uh, day one, uh, end of day one of illness. Since the patient already has uh, cerebral edema, so we started uh, anti encephalopathy measures as in uh, uh, head and elevation and uh, 3% in NS, uh, decreasing the temperature levels as a sensor patient presented with. Uh, uh, in uh, hypothermia at presentation was there. So we started on these measures along with the lactulose as well to decrease the further increase in ammonia load. Dr. Uday, how reliable is the lactate in the setting of ALF? Uh, depending upon the uh, initial lactate value, uh, the higher the lactate value the mot uh, with uh, associated with acute liver failure, the higher the mortality is uh, it can be used as a prognostic marker and also uh, for the putting a patient for a liver transplantation worker. Uh, the, and the lactate should be taken as the after fluid resuscitation, so not the initial lactate. Initial lactate could be abnormal as well, but after fluid resuscitation, if the lactate poses uh, to be uh, abnormal, then that should be taken into consideration. Would it be helpful in like guiding your fluid resuscitation? No, sir. Mm -hmm. Lactate clearance is basically Lactate. based by uh, liver function as well. So, if in case of acute liver failure, if the liver has been damaged so much, lactate clearance is going to be uh, abnormal. So, that we cannot take that as a marker of fluid resuscitation in uh, this point. Of. What is the role of fluid responsiveness checking in the setting of ALF? So, that will like help you in guiding the fluid resuscitation part. Yes, sir. We can use uh, invasive hemodynamic monitors. Uh, uh, such as PPV in uh, this setting, actually, that is uh, have a good reliability in telling us about uh, fluid responsiveness in an intubated patient as an our patient. Actually, the problem with the ALF is uh, fluid responsiveness. Uh, the role of fluid responsiveness may be limited because of the ineffective increase in the venous return because of the systemic venodilatation sir, or vasodilatation. Sir. So, again, checking the fluid responsiveness may not give you a proper idea how to go ahead with the fluid research tester right yes so that is that is one thing which is different from other clinical conditions that you need to remember again the lactate limitations you have to remember it would be only prognostication and uh, it, it may not like give you a proper idea how to go ahead with the fluid research tester because it is due to the liver pathology rather than the tissue hypoperfusion but yes, persistent elevation is associated with poor prognosis that you need to remember. So at this point of time, INR is 7.1 on day one, like outside report. So yes. is there any indication of uh, transfusion with the fresh frozen plasma? If no, then why? If yes, then why? The patient is actively bleeding. Yes, the patient can be transfused. But the problem is uh, with liver failure, there is decrease in procoagulants as well as well as anticoagulants. Both are depleted. Though the INR gives us a value, that does not essentially mean that the patient is pro prone for bleeding. In most of the cases, the patient is actually pro-coagulant state rather than in an anticoagulant state. So, we won't transfuse unless the patient is having an active bleed or anything. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, if you were uh, somebody is transfusing uh, like uh, in his own decision, 
with six units of FFP, how it is going to like uh, uh, trouble you in your NIR right? NIR is used as a prognostic marker actually, sir. So if we transfuse an INR and that may falsely tell us the patient is getting better. And that would hinder your like preparation for like your liver transplant is also. Yeah. Okay. So what is the role of NAC here? What is the literature supporting NAC? In which conditions you should give NAC? Usually, uh, in case of uh, paracetamol poisoning, that too, in uh, if patient is coming within eight hours of uh, paracetamol uh, ingestion, acute ingestion, uh, NAC therapy is instituted, sir. Uh, usually, it, it uh, as IV infusion therapy with uh, initial bolus of 100 mg per kg, followed by uh, 50 mg per kg in four hours and 100 mg per kg in next 16 hours. Uh, is uh, be, depending upon the nomogram uh, values. If uh, paracetamol plasma paracetamol levels were above the nomogram level, uh, we can uh, institute the NAC therapy in case of paracetamol poisoning. And uh, NAC therapy in uh, uh, other than paracetamol poisoning also studied, but there is no certain evidence to support the uh, other points. But still it is being used yes. in the non-paracetamol poisonings as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you monitor the coagulation parameters? Ideal monitoring system. Ideal monitoring, if we want to do, we should uh, take help of tech, sir. Take that yeah, Rotem. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Next slide. In day two, patient uh, still on mechanical ventilation, uh, mechanical ventilation because of hepatic uh, encephalopathy of grade three, and uh, with the uh, lab parameters of uh, uh, ammonia value of uh, came down to eighty one uh, from one sixty one, and uh, uh, creatinine remains to be normal uh, since admission, and uh, album and uh, INR uh, decreased to, from uh, three point nine to three point three, sir, and. Uh, in this time, uh, malarial parasite VNF uh, test was uh, came. Uh, it was not negative. What is the role of ammonia measurement in the, the management of ALF? Uh, so persistently increase uh, ammonia even after resuscitation. Then it tells us the patient has a bad prognosis and the patient has to be posted for a liver transplant at the earliest. Could you explain the pathogenetic role? Like and uh, ammonia increase will cause turn into glutamate in the astrocytes, it will cause swelling of the astrocytes in the brain, which is causing a cerebral edema, so that thereby increasing the intracranial pressure. So, there will be oxidative stress as well as mitochondrial dysfunction leading to the impairment in the brain energy metabolism, and that would also hinder the neurotransmitter release. And uh, finally, the patient will end up in coma and cerebral hernia. So, what is the uh, cutoff above which you would be like uh, classifying or keeping a close eye that this patient is a high risk for cerebral hernia? Mm -hmm. 150. 150? Micromole per liter. Okay. Yes. Let's yes, proceed to the next slide. Yeah, yeah, in day three, uh, in day three to four, uh, hepatic encephalopathy was reduced sir, from uh, grade three to grade two, and uh, INR remains to be same. And uh, uh, transaminitis levels were, were reduced uh, from six hundred levels to one fifty, and uh, total bilirubin is uh, re remains to be at the same level. Uh, between uh, 12 and with uh, there is a direct bill to bin levels and uh, patient is FR prime vitals for holding on sir. and in, at this time blood cultures report uh, came it was sterile okay your patient has never like uh, uh, suffered uh, acute renal failure so if the patient's creatinine starts uh, increasing on day 3 from 0.8 to 3.2 with metabolic acidosis persisting or worsening and uh, the patient is having 
very low urine output. What could be the change in your management? You will start the patient on CRRT at that point. Why CRRT is favored over uh, other modalities of dialysis? HFS modality is actually preferred, sir, because it was told that uh, the ammonia clearance is actually highest with the HF modality as compared to the other modalities. Any other advantage of CRRT uh, over intermittent modalities like PIRRT um, and other? The options? osmolarity change is actually more regulated actually with the CRRT. So that are, as well helps in uh, CRRT. Ammonia clearance. Anything else? Hemodynamics. Three things are very important. One, as you said, is the cerebral edema management. You need to avoid osmolar shifts as much as possible. Two, you need to have a meticulous control over the fluid balance. Um, so that is much more easily achievable. On one hand, patient is hypoalbuminemic. At the same time, the patient is hypovolemic. So whatever fluid you give, you need to have a tight control over it. And third point is, suppose this patient needs some antibiotic with a CRRT, you would be able to dose the full dose of antibiotics with a good control over the volume of distribution. So your therapeutic concentrations of antimicrobials would be as in a normal patient. If you initiate on a CRRT, you would not need to time the dosing of antimicrobials according to the timing and the initiation of the renal replacement therapy. So these will be the three prime importance, uh, uh, important aspects uh, of why you would choose a continuous modality over, uh, a, because anticoagulation is not going to be a challenge in these patients because most of them are self-anticoagulated because of the high INR. So you know, regional anticoagulation does not become an advantage in CRRT here because you can't use citrate anyway. You only have to use heparin and protein. So, uh, you don't, uh, don't, anticoagulation is not an advantage, but the other three are strong um, aspects of advantage. Yes. Yes. So, could you please uh, differentiate between the management in a case of active liver failure and another case where the patient is in decompensated chronic liver failure? So decompensated liver failure with the hepatic encoder, you should look for the cause, what caused the decompensation. And, uh, and decompensated patient, they are not posted for liver transplant unless the primary cause of decompensation is hepatitis B or Wilson's disease, as I initially eliminated. So in decompensation liver disease, we'll be giving uh, rifaxamine and uh, lactulose as well to as an anti-encephalopathic measures. And uh, apart from that, uh, We'll be trying to look for what is the cause, as in whether the patient had a GI bleed or the patient had an hypovolemia or the patient had any sort of other infection which has predisposed to the decompensation at that point should be evaluated and uh, taken care. The post-acute liver failure, where uh, uh, we prime importance is uh, given to uh, decreasing the uh, cerebral edema by uh, uh, intubating the patient at the grade three or grade four encephalopathy uh, uh, right away and. Uh, starting on 3% uh, uh, NS to decrease uh, cerebral edema and uh, uh, posting the patient for a liver transplant at the earliest. So those things will take a priority. And simultaneously, the cost evaluation also will play a picture in. Uh... Would you enumerate the management strategy, which normally we uh, prefer in the case of decompensated chronic liver disease, uh, but that should not be advocated. At least the evidence doesn't support in the management of acute liver failure. Ornithine based ammonia lowering therapy. Yes, sir. The literature is equivocal rather than uh, it is never advocating that you should use ornithine based acute uh, the ammonia lowering therapy along with rifamixin. That is again not having a strong evidence. Mm -hmm that we normally uh, start on the day one in a case of decompensated chronic liver disease. What is the role of induced hypothermia in the management of acute liver failure? Uh, with induced hypothermia, there is, there is a significant increase, decrease in uh, cerebral metabolic requirement of oxygen. So that uh, uh, decreased uh, 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 decreased cerebral blood flow and uh, decreases the ICP, thereby decreases the ICP. Sir. And, Would you uh, recommend it as a prophylactic measure? 
No, sir. It is only used in case of young patients with acetamin, uh, paracetamol poisoning. And uh, other uh, in they studied in other groups, but there is no clear-cut benefit in other groups. Sir. Uh, Sorry, in young patients with paracetamol poisoning, is it? With refractory elevation in ICP, in that case, you can try into moderate hypothermia rather than What is the role of extracorporeal liver support in the management of acute liver failure? Mm, extracorporeal liver support, what has been advocated is they can use uh, mass based or prometheus based uh, system as a salvament dialysis and uh, uh, high volume plasma paresis uh, has been also been uh, tried. So both the systems actually what it does is it helps us in uh, more of a clearance of uh, ammonia and clearance of uh, normalization of INR. Biochemical uh, correction has been uh, more seen, but when you look at the actual uh, mortality benefit uh, or uh, liver transplant recovery, that has not been shown actually both in uh, albumin dialysis and uh, plasma versus based systems. What is the difference between bioartificial liver support and artificial liver support? Uh, I'm not sure, sir. Okay. Sir, could you please? Uh... Yeah, so um, now the tendency is not to use synthetic membranes. Yes. The, uh, the tendency or the line of thinking is to mimic the natural liver cells or the renal uh, glomeruli as much as possible. So lab grown hepatocytes are uh, loaded onto a column and they do the function of detoxification, which a normal hepatocyte would do in a nutshell, that is bioartificial liver support. When you use a synthetic membrane, like what you do for renal replacement and ECMOs, these are all just liver support, right? Now, any form of liver support when combined either with uh, a plasma exchange or with CRRT or both. And sometimes when there is myocardial depression, a combination of these three with ECMO is called as extracorporeal organ support or multi-organ support therapy. So ECOS and MOST are now uh, possible uh, for patients with hepatic failure who have multi-organ involvement. Suppose somebody has a hepatorenal because of a pulmonary or a hyperacute liver failure, along with it, a myocardial depression and a uh, hypoxemic respiratory failure, you can resort to most or ECOS to salvage the situation as a bridge to definitive therapy. Okay. So, uh, in addition to Sir has uh, told uh, you know, the basic difference between your bioartificial and artificial liver support device, uh, bioartificial will cover both the two things needed that all liver synthetic functions along with the detoxification. But artificial is only for the detoxification. So the efficiency is actually limited in the artificial. But biosynthetic or bioartificial is actually having promising results. And the, the examples, the examiner may ask you if you are doing very good. That is ELAD, that is extracorporeal liver assist device and hepat assist. So these two are the bioartificial. In artificial, what we all know since long, some centers are using that is MARS. What is MARS? Molecular absorbent system. Molecular absorbent uh, recirculation system. Recirculating system. What is pad? Single pass albumin dialysis and Prometheus. So definitely the cost is higher in the bioartificial, but artificial it is less. And naturally it is relatively easier to like uh, implement in the your ICU. But bioartificial is actually difficulty in maintaining all the cellular components because you need to put the cells in that uh, like the the uh, filter or membrane. So that's why bioartificial is a little bit having a difficulty in maintaining as well as putting the patient down. Okay, what is the role of starting empirical antibiotic therapy? Because right now your patient is having no uh, the organisms grown in the blood culture. So, uh, should we st uh, stop the antibiotics at this yes. point of time? Yes, sir. Patient is actually improving trend, and uh, there is no patient is safer. Braille. So, 
there is no role of antibiotic uh, even there is no role of empirical antibiotic therapy as well but uh, we should have a high suspicion and uh, if at all we think the patient is having so uh, infection or the patient is having hypertension or in spite blood resuscitation then yes but uh, but the recent 2022 or uh, the article if you want to go through current opinion in critical care as per the european association for the study of liver easl treatment guidelines they recommend that there should be high vigilance for sepsis and a low threshold for administering uh, your empirical prospectrum antibiotic treatment in lf patients with sepsis or patients with worsening hepatic encephalopathy or those patients who are potential for your emergency liver transplant candidates in those patients you cannot take that uh, risk of like uh, subjecting your patient to sepsis just for the sake that you should not start with the empirical antibiotic you are not getting any culture sensitivity positive something like that so definitely there is role of empiric antibiotics when the patient is deteriorating faster okay next slide day five so what is happening from outside now day 1 day 2 day 3 4 and day 5 how do you like describe the clinical course of this patient in your icu as you see the each component sir and uh, bilirubin transaminase values were also reduced from uh, day 1 to uh, day 5 and uh, the clinical improvement in uh, uh, patient gcs also improved from uh, day 0 to day 5 and uh, and also but uh, it like your uh, bilirubin levels uh, remains to be at the higher end uh, even uh, with uh, good clinical response uh, yes sir if uh, right now you are telling now the day 3 to 4 the patient has improved and day 5 was estimated now something happened on the day 4 and the patient has crashed and now the patient's bp is right now 80 by 40 now the blood pressure requirement is right now vasopressor is on high dose of noradrenaline as well as vasopressin and the patient's pupillary signs are actually less brisk now so what is going on at this point of time oh patient is actually having a, a new onset sepsis can be there at this point because as we told the uh, elf is actually in a slightly immunocompromised compromise situation in on top the patient has been ventilated for 3 or 4 days so vap can be a possibility which is causing uh, this kind of a picture and or even acute deterioration in the uh, hepatic encephalopathy can also happen as it all because the pupillary signs are uh, not uh, reacting and the patient should be posted for an uh, emergency liver transplant if possible right could there be a cns event yes sir. and yeah. high likely of uh, cere- cerebral herniation is a high possibility in case of acute liver failure uh, with worsening picture sir and so you did the ct scan the ct scan is showing right uh, massive intracranial hemorrhage in the frontal lobe that is actually causing the midline shift as well as uh, interventricular exit sir and uh, could be like uh, the patient is going into hernia sir and you did the inr inr is right now from 3.4 on day 3 right now it jumped to 7.5 what to be done at this point of time as uh, so brain is a closed space uh, we have to control the bleeding sir by correcting the coagulopathy and uh, if uh, platelets were reduced uh, we have to go, uh, give the platelets uh to target up more than 1 lakh platelets are okay platelets are right now 1.5 lakh yes and uh, correction of uh, coagula- coagulation is uh, paramount in uh, uh, to preventing further bleeding and uh, and also uh, how do you prognosticate the family how do you communicate with the family the neuro you have taken the neurosurgery consultation the surgeon is saying that he may take the really case to the or immediately so you please stabilize the patient the family uh, like right now the relatives are waiting anxiously outside the icu your liver enzymes are improving the patient's uh, bilirubin is improving the lactate is somehow uh, uh, static the abg is improving but the patient has suffered with some acute intracranial insult and deteriorated coagulopathy so at this point of time as he told will uh, start uh, correcting the coagulopathy uh, to explain oh, to the relatives the prognosis 
is going to be actually uh, very uh, bad actually since the patient had an intracranial uh, bleed the outcome as well has been uh, very much slower near okay. to the family wants to do everything and the fertility of treatment and uh, outcomes uh, will explain regarding this in this case neurosurgeon wants to ship the patient to the or within 30 minutes otherwise the patient will suffer from irreversible brain damage how do you optimize the coagulation parameter at this point of time the patient's heart is full uh, he is almost uh, having uh, no chance of like scope of giving more fluids you have ordered with the ffp but uh, one of your resident has told that uh, patient will go into pulmonary edema uh, in this case four factor uh, pc uh, pcc can be tried sir uh but uh, even with the treatment uh, the possibility of worsening picture and uh, high likely of uh, because of background acute liver failure uh, we'll make use of tech as well at this point to see what exactly is wrong and what we need to transfuse okay anything sir no no let let them go on yeah. okay. we can move to the next slide sir the patient was shifted out the next slide right okay <laughs> now how do you uh, okay to um, icu they shifted out of icu they forgot out out shifted to ward actually think is it right or is it shifted to icu yes. out of is out of icu out of icu okay now how do you prioritize your management strategies when i when i want you to give a structured approach to a patient with hepatic failure how are you going to compartmentalize your approach for these patients so one is airway airway securing airway and neuroprotection that uh, takes a priority of all followed by the hemodynamics mm -hmm. so uh our neuro protection uh, as we told the head and elevation the temperature control normocarbia normotherapy uh, uh, everything will be playing into the picture Adi maintaining adequate map maintaining adequate, adequate map. so yeah. now you divide it into what are the top derangements which threaten somebody's life in a patient with permanent hepatic failure so you need to optimize the cerebral hemodynamics as a first priority second is to address the metabolic derangements that happen in liver failure the third one is to uh, address the hematostatic abnormalities that happen in uh, liver failure and the fourth one would be look at the multi the extra hepatic organ dysfunctions that happen in liver dysfunction that is how you strategize right now when i want to improve somebody's cerebral perfusion what am i going to target i am going to target a mean arterial pressure as you said because that's the predominant determinant now what are your options for optimizing hemodynamics in a patient who has already got enough fluid who can't take any more fluid is already saturating 94% on oxygen what are your options evidence based options for hemodynamic optimization no, i will give you the options i'll give you the basket you grade them in the order of this is my top preference second preference third preference fourth preference early pressing vasopressin norepinephrine norepinephrine plus midodrine midodrine plus adrenaline dopamine plus midodrine where do you put this okay, grade them one being the best uh, whatever is the last norepinephrine will top the list sir And so uh, the current randomized control trials and meta analysis seem to suggest that early pressin is probably a little better than norepinephrine in cirrhotic patients in non cirrhotic patients it is norepinephrine which is the preferred drug of choice now between vasopressin and early pressin how do you decide which one will work which one is above which one is below no idea okay in a patient who is oliguric who is looking at a renal replacement therapy in the next 6 to 8 hours 
vasopressin is probably superior to telemedicine. But in a patient who's already compromised uh, perfusion, who's come with peripheral mottling, uh, terlipressin may be superior to vasopressin. Okay, that's how you decide. What, what is your understanding about the role of midodrine in patients with acute liver failure? We know that there are a group of people who believe in giving it for cirrhotics, even at home. But what is your understanding about midodrine-based therapy for hemodynamic optimization in acute liver failure? Sir, no idea. Sir. So uh, there has been a randomized controlled trial which looked at using midodrine alone versus midodrine plus norepinephrine. There doesn't seem to be any, any advantage with the use of midodrine in patients with acute liver failure. But subacute patients, especially those with an underlying liver disease, probably will have some advantage of you uh, with midodrine. We don't know the uh, correct numbers yet. Okay. Now. Uh, how do you look at what are the metabolic derangements which are poor prognostic markers um, among patients with acute liver failure? Uh, hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, increased phosphate in a paracetamol poisoning. Yeah, today I would like to, you know, I'm a little particular about certain terminologies. So you, have to, you have to pardon me for that. But don't use the word poisoning for paracetamol. You have to use the word overdose. Okay. for paracetamol, right? You don't use uh, over, uh, organophosphate overdose, right? You call it organophosphate poisoning, right? You call it paracetamol overdose. It may not make a difference, but uh, overdose is for an excess dose for something that is normally prescribed is a pharmacological agent. You don't have a normal dose for poor people. Just correct you that, sir. Okay? You are super specialist, so we should make sense. You know, we should look more than anybody else you know, when you talk. Okay. okay. Um, now, what are the extra hepatic organ dysfunctions? We already discussed about renal dysfunction. What other extra hepatic renal dis, uh, no, um, uh, hepa dysfunction, extra hepatic dysfunctions can you anticipate in patients with uh, liver failure, both acute and subacute? Hyperdynamic uh, coming to cardiovascular system, uh, hyperdynamic circulation because of uh, uh, redu uh, reduced the systemic vascular resistance secondary to the. Uh, uh, nitric nitric va vasoactive, uh, vasoactive agents, uh, nitric, like nitric oxide, and uh, increase in heart rate combinedly increases the cardiac output in initial phase. And uh, uh, after uh, after, in, uh, adic after increasing the systemic uh, vas increased vasodilatation, there is a decrease in venous return in the uh, in latter stages, causes a decrease in cardiac output. Sir. In initial stages, hyperdynamic uh, circulation uh, followed by uh, a decrease in cardiac output in later stages. Okay, so I'll put it a little briefly. Uh, you have a hepatoadrenal syndrome. If apart from the hepatorenal syndrome, you have hepatoadrenal syndrome and a hepatohematological syndrome, right? Hepatoadrenal, just like septic shock, there is an uh, there is a uh, relative adrenal insufficiency um, even among patients with acute liver failure. So they are corticosteroid depleted. Patients with acute liver failure, apart from the general coagulopathy of uh, uh, liver, uh, liver uh, failure, also will have bone marrow suppression. So they can actually have a thrombocytopenia that is independent of the liver failure. Right? And of course, like other syndromes, this is also associated with uh, cardiomyopathy, both a tachycardia myopathy as well as a dilated uh, flabby heart uh, okay. There's a question on the chat box. Um, explain the rationale of superiority of vasopressin over telepressin. The superiority of vasopressin is vasopressin, apart from being a vasopressor, uh, the, the, the physiological role of vasopressin in health is different from the role of vasopressin in a shock state and in a vasodilated state. The role is totally different when the person is absolutely healthy, but when the physiology is deranged, it has a preferential action as a uh, renal uh, you know, fluid conservator as well as a vasopressor. So patients who are oliguric tend to develop non-oliguric renal failure and tend to uh, you know, escape dialysis more often 
when they are treated with vasopressin when compared to telepressin. That is the potential advantage of vaso over telepressin. Yeah. So there's a comment about 3% saline versus mannitol in acute liver failure as we want to avoid hypernatremia. Uh, both of you, would you like to take a call on why you should give 3% saline or why you should give mannitol or why you should not give both? Hyponatremia itself poses an independent uh, poor prognostic factor. So uh, giving a 3% saline actually will be a, a good choice in a patient who was already having a hyponatremia. And um, using an osmolar diuretic, an osmotic diuretic like mannitol may actually complicate the interpretation of your uh, um, osmolar studies first point. Second, it could trigger a hepatic, uh, 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 trigger a renal dysfunction. And third point, uh, it can actually uh, cause rebound cerebral edema because of its higher filtration coefficient uh, into the brain. Saline, actually there has been a recently published uh, randomized controlled trial which has compared the albumin versus uh, plasma light for uh, cirrhotic patients with septic shock and found that plasma albumin is probably superior but does not confer any mortality advantage. Um, Dr. Shilpa Reddy is asking us whether there's any INR trigger to start FFP, uh, especially more than six. Would you both like to take a call on that? In acute liver failure patients, uh, both uh, anticoagulation factors and procoagulant factors were deranged. Uh, so only in case of uh, bleeding, uh, life-threatening life bleedings and uh, decrease in uh, hemoglobin values, only in these cases only we need to correct the and if, if any procedure was warranted in that cases only we need to correct the coagulopathy okay so her question is when do you start what is your trigger for start giving ffp too much no sir there is no term to cut off triggers actually yeah so uh, now you need to look at the etiology on the background of which the inr is deranged Pregnancy-related liver failure, for example, a, um, an AFLP, for example, or a HELP syndrome with DIC, for example, your approach will be totally different if the patient is in the perioperative period. Yeah. But if the patient is not overtly bleeding, hemodynamics are stable, the hemoglobin has stayed static, it is better not to tinker with an INR just because of an absolute number of INR. Because the, the consequences of lung injury, which happen... Uh, because of you know over enthusiastic use of blood and blood products can be detrimental to the compromised brain in these patients. So that's the link. Uh, somebody called anonymous attendee is asking us um, any relationship with the trend of ammonia value with prognostication. One of you can take that uh, call. Ammonia usually ammonia values uh, does not correlate with hepatic encephalopathy, sir. Yeah. But uh, increase in ammonia values along with the clinical deterioration uh, warrants to decrease the ammonia values. Uh, in case if patient is having renal failure, uh, early initiation of a renal replacement therapy in mode of a CRRT uh, can uh, actually decrease the ammonia values and uh, thereby helping the cerebral protection. Okay. The same person is asking us how frequently you check serum ammonia. If the patient is having any clinical improvement, I don't think uh, we should check for an uh, frequent uh, one. If the patient doesn't have a clinical improvement and uh, you can just check whether to see whether it's a decreasing trend or not once. I don't think that's again we need to repeat again. Yeah. But I would like to say to tell my friend anonymous attendee, um, there is no this thing in asking questions. You can reveal your identity actually. You should not feel shy in revealing your identity for asking questions. Anyway, uh, if you prefer it that way, we are more than happy with that. Dr. Nikolesh wants to know the rationale for using vitamin K. Uh, there are some amount of liver which is actively uh, involved in uh, synthesizing function. Vitamin K will be helpful uh, in that way. And uh, after supplementation of vitamin K also, the INR is not becoming normal uh, after two or three days, which tells us that... Uh, the liver is going bad or the patient has to be planned for a transplant at the earliest. 
So galaxy M30, is there any advantage to measure arterial ammonia or venous ammonia? No. Um, there was a school of thought before that you can't rely on uh, arterial ammonia, but now, uh, you know, if you have a trend, if you have the trends of venous ammonia, it's good enough. Tapas, your take on this? Yeah, exactly. If you have a trend, so definitely there is no difference between arterial and venous. One of the senior intensivists from Isaac, Dr. John David, uh, is asking us any role of ICP monitoring in worsening GCS. If so, it has been recommended to have an uh, ICP monitoring. The patient is having persistently increased uh, ammonia, and a uh, uh, patient is uh, going bad. But uh, studies uh, actually, when we compared an invasive monitoring tool, there is no difference in uh, mortality benefit or uh, liver transplantation has been shown even with invasive yeah. ICP monitoring. So, so the point here is you should have a measure of cerebral hemodynamics. So that measure can come with a judicious combination of optic nerve sheet diameter and a transcranial Doppler. A comparative study which showed an invasive monitor compared with a DCD uh, uh, plus ONSG showed good correlation at the first point. The second point is now there is a school of thought which says that a judicious use of biomarkers like neuron-specific NLAs and S100 beta in patients who have documented hepatic encephalopathy and raised ICP on CT scan as a trend can tell you if the worst brain function is deteriorating. Okay. Now, Dr. Prasad wants us wants to know if the HRS develops with prior healthy liver, like viral hepatitis, there is, is there any change in the management of hepatorenal syndrome than is used for uh, ALD or cirrhotic HRS? So the HRS which develops in fulminant hepatic failure usually resolves. They don't end up with ATN like what happens with CRS, uh, the other forms of uh, thing. But in the acute phase, the management po policies are exactly the same. Uh, Dr. Kavita wants to know the difference between CRRT versus plasma exchange. One of you can take that answer. CRRT, we are just going to uh, run the blood through the filter, which actually takes up the substrate, the small molecular substrates like this ammonia, urea, in our case, bilirubin, I mean, I'm sorry, ammonia and urea can be actually taken up from the CRRT, thereby increasing the clinical symptom. Plasma paresis, we actually take out the entire plasma from the patient and we are going to put up a new fresh flows and plasma wherein we can see biochemical improvements in apart from our uh, ammonia. So we can also see improvements in uh, bilirubin and uh, INR as well can be seen in uh, plasma viruses. And also, it, well. yeah. So, sorry, Tapas. No, no. I'm just asking, what is the evidence right now for uh, plasma viruses in case with active liver failure? It uh, helps in patient who is going for non-transplant recession, but in transplant uh, transplant recipient, there is no change whether you do a plasma versus or not. So few years back, high volume plasma versus is the only modality that has demonstrated significant uh, benefit in the transplant free survival in patients with ALF. But the recent studies, they have compared between the standard, uh, the volume plasma versus and uh, the high volume plasma places. So they compared and they found that standard volume plasma exchange is also uh, equivalent in providing the transplant free time in the uh, ALF patients. And that would rather uh, prevent the complications of high volume plasma places like your uh, transfusion related complications, your uh, uh, risk of fluid overload, as well as your uh, the trally. So that is the current evidence. So, to just put that into perspective, CRRT and PLEX are two different philosophical, different uh, aspects. CRRT is a broad term which includes CVVH, CVVHD, CVVHDF. So, it is more of a detoxifying mechanism which tries to get out the middle molecules and water out of the system. Right, you want to do ultra filtration for somebody who's volume overloaded and is compromising his cardiac, respiratory, and renal function. 
CRRT is the way to do plasma exchange has no role in fluid removal because you replace what you remove in plasma exchange. Where does plasma exchange come in? It comes in where certain toxins have to be removed and certain coagulation factors have to be added. Now, there is a filter now that is available which can actually reduce the load of bilirubin in these patients, especially pre-transplant. You can reduce the bilirubin which has some beneficial effect on the overall coagulopathy. There's a question from Dr. Prashant who asks you uh, generally when you will include the liver transplant team into the loop and what are your trigger points in alerting the transplant team? One of you can do it. Yes, uh, based upon the uh, criteria, sir, and uh, King's uh, College criteria uh, showing uh, if uh, acute liver failure uh, secondary to uh, paracetamol over overdosage, uh, with pH of less than 7.3 and uh, uh, hepatic encephalopathy grading of uh, 3 and 4 and uh, bilirubin of uh, more than uh, 3.4 and uh, I and uh, INR values of uh, uh, prothrombin type of time of more than 100 or INR of more than 6 uh, uh, in case of paracetamol poisoning and in case of uh, non-paracetamol poisoning cases PT uh, prothrombin time of uh, more than 100 or uh, other factors such as uh, uh, age, uh, if it is less than 10 or more than uh, or more than 40, and uh, below, uh, and uh, PT of uh, PT of more than 50, and uh, the other causating factors such as uh, idiosyncratic uh, drug, uh, drug related and uh, non A non B hepatitis related causes uh, can trigger actually and uh, can be used as a uh, criteria for. Uh, putting a patient for organ uh, liver transplantation workup. And uh, other criteria is glitchy criteria. It is based upon the factor 5 SS and, uh, and age. If it is more than, uh, if it is age less than 30 years uh, and uh, factor levels of less than 20%. And if it is age, more, uh, age any age more than 30%, 30, uh, factor levels of less than 30 percent is uh, factor five levels of less than 30 percent is a criteria for uh, putting a patient into uh, liver transplant. So I told you three advantages of CRRT. So can you repeat those three for the benefit of Dr. Prashant? Would I? Just as I am paying attention to what you are saying, you also have to pay attention to what me and Tapas are saying. See, the advantage so of fluid, one is fluid removal, other thing yeah. is small molecular uh, clearance and yeah. detoxification. These are the three. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so can we take Harini wants to know can we take a patient with acute or hyperacute liver failure, hepat viral hepatitis related failure for liver transplant? and role of prophylactic antibiotics or antifungals prior to liver transplant? Uh, Hyperacute and acute uh, liver failures usually results spontaneously uh, because, because uh, known causating uh, agents such as uh, uh, paracetamol old age has a uh, higher uh, uh, recovery rate compared with other sub subacute variants such as uh, idiosyncratic and uh, uh, hepatitis B uh, super super infection with hepatitis uh, D and uh, other factors and uh, other drug induced uh, hepatitis uh, and hepatitis acutely acutely failure secondary to other uh, drug induced causes and uh, uh, so I'll just uh, you know add to that what Dr Harini has asked you suppose there is somebody who is on uh, ATT for pulmonary tuberculosis and has developed ATT induced liver failure, would you consider transplant? Yes, uh, no. No, sir. Stopping of therapy initially. See, patient deteriorating has got cerebral edema, is bleeding, IR, enzymes in thousands, INR in the roof. Would you consider transplant or not? So these comes under uh, secondary causes of. Uh... This thing. So mm -hmm. I don't think for secondary causes we plan transplant at any point. Yes, I think you are on the right track. Mm -hmm. uh, with this background history, our friend Anonymous 
with this background history, when if hepatitis A virus is negative, will you suspect Wilson's disease? In which scenario will you think of Wilson's disease? It will be it's suspected that when the patient actually has initially present with increased uh, GI symptoms, aka then the patient will go into liver failure. That's a clinical picture and uh, we'll be looking at an increase, a decreased uh, alpha level as compared to bilirubin also will be seen in the uh, liver and we can measure uh, and also, serum celluloplasmin and uh, serum copper and urinary excretion of copper as well for the diagnosis. And also presence of hemolysis and uh, DCT negative, direct home test negative hemolysis uh, will be presence seen. will be seen. Yeah. So uh, just uh, adding one more uh, to that hepatitis uh, virus infection, the HBS antigen is negative. Does that mean that this patient is uh, not having any hepatitis B infection? That no. would cause ALF. No, no, sir. In uh, HBS AG antigen and viral antigens is usually rapidly cleared by the immune immunity, sir. Uh, then we have to look for uh, IgM antibodies to pour uh, and antigen uh, rather than uh, going for uh, HBSAG antigens. In active infections, uh, presence of IgM antibodies uh, will be there. So normally, like if the patient is having hepatitis B infection, the uh, supraphysiologic immune response that occurs in initial one or two days, that would try to eliminate the complete like the hepatitis B infection. So you won't get the hepatitis B surface antigen. So at that time, as you told, it would be a prudent to go for the IgM hepatitis B antibody. That would exclude that this patient is not having hepatitis B related active liver failure. Yeah. Role of NAC in severe dengue related ALF? No role. No, no, it's not no role, but uh, if there is a dysfunction and a shock patient, just as you use it for other toxic non-paracetamol toxicity, you can still use uh, in the same algorithm for NAC uh, for dengue-related acute liver failure and with good results in uh, reversal of, I don't know whether there is a mortality benefit, but whatever small uh, population studies from northeast of the country have shown, uh, good resolution of the coagulopathy associated with dengue. Now, the other thing on this issue is that in dengue, just because the question has been raised, it is not the thrombocytopenia which causes the problem. There is a dysfunction of ADMTS13, uh, which was shown in a study from Bellor. Uh, they have shown that and uh, the ADMTS13 levels need to be considered and that actually if a patient with dengue is bleeding, an FFP may be a better solution than giving it. Related. That's beside the point. What about nutritional management in ALF? Coming to uh, nutrition, sir, uh, uh, we have to target uh, if, as ALF is a highly catabolic state with a negative nitrogen balance. And uh, we need to give high protein diet. Initially, we have to start with the 40 gram per day. And uh, Calorie requirement also, 20, uh, we have to target 25 to 35 kilocalorie per day. And uh, we uh, and ALF patients are more prone for hypoglycemias. And uh, because of the uh, uh, decreased gluconeogenesis and uh, glycogen, uh, decline in uh, glycogen storage levels. Uh, because of this, we have to, uh, patients may need 10% uh, 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 infusions of uh, sugar containing solutions. And uh, uh, during during the nutrition therapy, we have to closely monitor the potassium values uh, and phosphorus values and uh, magnesium values. And uh, there is a high likelihood of uh, hypokalemia and hypo hypophosphatemia and uh, hypomagnesiemia. Uh, we have to correct the electrolyte imbalance also. Uh, Sashidhar and Venkat, do you have time for the two more questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, we can go ahead. Yeah, so uh, hepatic failure, acute liver failure of pregnancy. Do you, is there, do you think there are any special uh, situations or recommendations? Uh, in case of uh, pregnancy-related acute fatty liver of pregnancy, mm. 
the termination of pregnancy itself uh, uh, reverses the liver injuries. Uh, we have low iron uh, targets actually as compared to the other liver failures. So if, if it is a uh, pregnancy that is continuing versus the pregnancy that is ended, right? You are having somebody who is still gravid. Uh, the solution is to terminate the pregnancy if that is the cause of the liver dysfunction. Uh, otherwise, uh, you need to manage it. Uh, but in this context, pregnancy being a hypercoagulable state, your assessment of the coagulation failure is better done with a rotem than with INR and PT. That also has to be remembered in this context. Now, the same uh, question is, this patient had an INR of 7. So why was the transplant team not included in the planning? Is the question. That was on the first day or in the outside laboratory, actually. In day two, so the since, INR started coming down, actually. So, so since, since you found an improvement clinically and well as metabolically, you chose not to involve the transplant. Right? Okay. Uh, sometimes... Yeah, Tapas. Sorry. Yeah, just to add, uh, you cannot like take one lab parameter and take the decision of liver transplant itself. It has to be pragmatic and covers like the whole clinical management as well as the trained in the improvement. If the patient is deteriorating further, definitely the transplant team would be included and uh, you would be proceeding. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes NAC causes anaphylaxis, whether to hold or continue risk benefit wise if there is an improvement in your inr and your uh, transaminases you should continue just like an anti snake venom for example you don't stop asv if the patient develops an anaphylaxis you take care of the anaphylaxis but give the antidote so this the same logic applies for NAC as well depending on the risk benefit you uh, can we have hrs in the setting of alf yes you can um, it is all there are types of hrs so there is specific types of HRS which can happen in uh, acute liver failure as well. Is Rotem better than TEG? See, in one, the pin moves. In the second, the, the cup moves. Right. So the, your assessment of the clot stability and fibrinolysis is better with the Rotem than with the TEG. In the context of liver monitoring, Rotem is technologically an advancement over TEG. So although we use it you know, inter interchangeably, they are two different techniques. Thank you, Santosh. Uh, in patients with drug-induced liver failure like ATT, we don't do transplant. Good question, Dr. Kavita. <laughs> That's what I wanted them to answer. If you do transplant, uh, you need to give immunosuppression. What will happen to the tuberculosis? The, my question was that. But anyway, she got the point. Just to add, uh... There are uh, certain instances, conditions where you would be uh, not advocating transplantation, though the patient is having acute liver failure. Dr. Uday, could you please tell me? Sir, uh, uh, with multi-organ involvement and... Uh, uh, so, like if the patient is having hypoxic hepatitis, malignancy, and severe systemic infections like dengue, malaria, and with complicated like multi-organ failure and also one of the condition what we have discussed now pulmonary cox uh, on ATT. So in those conditions uh, ELT is usually contraindicated because you are not able to control the whole system rather than you will be only going for one organ support that is organ transplantation with the cleaver. I think we have come to the end of yeah. all the questions but it's been an excellent uh, presentation both of you. Yes. Um, very systematic and you took us through how you manage this difficult case. Well done. Um, thank, well, you, thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. Session there, in fact, it's open to you now. Very well done, Dr. Uday and uh, Dr. Vignesh. Vignesh. Yeah. 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 So you covered well and uh, they said also uh, we can perfectly okay within five days. So that's the beauty of like uh, it uh system wise and uh, very systematic approach and uh, finally uh, we got many clues also related to the complications as well as the nitty-gritties of the management thank you thank you dr venkat for giving the opportunity over to you sasi sir your comments sir
No, I, I think um, uh, it was an excellent session, sir. It was um, the, the the run through was very uh, what you said enjoyable. We all enjoyed uh, being participating it on the back end. Um, thank you for both of you. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Srinivas sir, and thank you, Tapas sir, for giving your time and knowledge to all the students. Sir. And uh, usually we will give case to students at least uh, three weeks before. This time we gave in short notice, but still they got a good case for discussion. Thank you, Uday and uh, Vignesh for getting a good case for discussion. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.